it is true, it is a fact that you and I may not see things the same way. You and I may not look at the same set of circumstances and find ourselves in agreement, unless we talk about it, in agreement over what we saw. You and I may not understand things the same way or have it applied to our lives in the same way. Even the scriptures themselves as we read them, God may choose to use a particular portion of scripture in a different way for you than he does for me. And so, you see, Jesus said it this way, according to your faith be it unto you. And it wasn't as though you had to have this massive amount of faith in order to do something or that you had to generate faith in order to become something, but it was according to your relationship with God that the Holy Spirit would apply something to you. You see, God is still in control. God is still the one revealing himself to you. God is the one who makes applicable the word of God to your life. And that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. But more than that, it is a reality of a spiritual dimensional concept that's put into our way of thinking so that we can understand something about God that we do not know and we do not really have a handle on. Because people in like faith movements or faith ideas like to generate this concept of if they drum up enough faith, God has to act. God can only act if we have enough faith. And none of those things apply. They may apply in how we perceive something that God is doing. It may apply in how the Holy Spirit decides to use something in our life in order to construct something in our life to give us a better awareness. But all of your life is going to be an unveiling of who God is and the reality of how God does things in your life. And so, you and I, we may not see things eye to eye. As a matter of fact, probably with me, you may find that you disagree with me at certain particular times because I'll come to you and say, hey, you know, I don't know what you just said, but no, it's not in the Bible. It's not in Scripture because I'm pretty well aware of what's in Scripture as far as Scripture is concerned. It doesn't mean you're wrong and it doesn't mean you're right. It just simply means that as far as the Bible is concerned, it may not be in here according to the Word of God. And studying the Word of God, God often gives me that opportunity to know if it's there in Scripture or not. But that doesn't mean you're wrong either, because you see, God can use things in your life. God can use your wife, your children, your dog, your cat, the hummingbird, the sky that's out there right now, just beginning to dawn. He can use everything He wants to use and anything He wants to use at any moment in time that He chooses to use them because he created the universe. So, since God created the universe, bluntly, and though it has been corrupted by the influence of man and Satan in it, God is still God. <laughs> He's still the king of the universe. He's still master of everything. He still can do anything he chooses to do according to his will, his way, and his word. He doesn't have to limit himself according to the Bible. Some people like to put this whole concept of God won't do anything contrary to his word because he said that he would not contradict his word. Well, no offense to you, but you know what? I, you know, Jews pretty much had that one down already before, you know, Gentiles came along and guess what? Still, God seemed to contradict his word at first because this Jesus that came along was a contradiction to the understanding of the Word of God. I mean, even if you took a comma and added the gap theory that people like to you know, say, well, there's a big gap here. Well, no, there's no gap. It's just the way God does things. It's not because there's a gap and suddenly there's this time frame that you can throw in there anything you want to. No. You see, the concept of a gap is for our understanding. It isn't for God's understanding. As far as God's concerned, there's no gap. <laughs> There's no, there's no absence of his presence in anything that the scripture says. And so, 
while it's nice to use certain things to make us better able to comprehend, it really is not a good thing to keep saying, well, there's a gap here and a gap there and a gap everywhere, so fall into the gap, because that's what's going to happen. The more that you promote the idea that there's a gap somewhere, the more that you start to say, oh, well, if there's a gap there, why not over here? And why not here? Why not over there? So the continuity of God is such that he's perfect. We're not. Our understanding is limited. His thoughts are not our thoughts, neither his ways our ways. So he is the one who makes it applicable to us. He's the one who applies it in our life. He's the one who chooses to be our God and our creator. He is our personal Lord and Savior, Jesus is the one who is the only perfect example of the revelation of God made manifest in the flesh that we can trust in and know. So, whenever theology gets into involved into man's religion, then somehow it gets a little confusion because they try to put into concepts things that really may not apply to you, but apply to somebody somewhere at some point in time, so they had to come up with this rule, regulation, law, dogma, doctrine, or some kind of idea that makes fit for their understanding, remember, <laughs> their understanding, <laughs> not God's, but, uh, and then they try to make it fit to God, and no offense, but this shoe does not fit God. No matter how hard I try, no matter what I do, the shoe doesn't fit. And so, sometimes when I try to give you my shoe and tell you to walk in my shoes for a while, no offense, doesn't fit, does it? Because I may wear a different size than you do. That's why our lives are customized according to His will and His word for ourselves to learn and to appreciate a personal relationship with God. Yes, there are things that you enjoy with other people and you come together and you're able to worship the Lord, but your personal experiences aren't like anybody else's personal experiences, you know. You've been someplace that maybe somebody else hadn't been. You've done things with God maybe somebody else hadn't done. And so you see things a little bit differently. Matter of fact, the older I get, the more I see things differently. <laughs> Without my glasses, I don't see so good. <laughs> With my glasses, sometimes I don't see so good. But the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us that application of the Word of God in our circumstances for our personal revelation of who Jesus is. And that's why it requires that the Spirit of God be in us. That's why it says that if we are born again of the Spirit, we are led by the Spirit and we become spiritual beings because it is God's Spirit that leads us and guides us, not our own. Because if we lean into our own understanding, really, I mean, come on, how many different Bible schools have you seen that they all say they believe in the same thing, but when you start reading some of their papers and people that are trying to make some doctrine or get their THD, PhD, or some kind of special designation, Wow, aren't they special? That they make all kinds of weird statements, you know. I've I've actually kind of like listened to theologians and to me they're like less smart than the child that says, Jesus loves me, this I know, because often there's a purity of that person that Jesus loves and they know than there is about the paper that somebody presents. And so they were trying to find some new way to prove or to state the obvious that God is trying to make. I wrote a paper that actually is called um, Integral Specificity, just for theologians, because really all it is is just simply the Bible says what it means, it means what it says. But I worded it in such a way that I can prove dogmatically and theologically in that format for theologians of how the Bible says what it means, it means what it says. That no, the existential reality of the integral, integral specificity of the, I was trying to think, the relational objectivity, uh, no, the relational object of the word itself is designated in its specificity according to where it's located, as it's located, the way it's located, which is what it is, what it is, where it is, as it is. <laughs> so, 
sure you can make things more complicated than they are or you can just say hey God said it so we do it that's how simple it is <laughs> so when God speaks to you you do it when God speaks to me I do it when we come together I may not understand how you got to where you got but I can I can appreciate your personal relationship with Jesus and that's what brings us together you see it's not the question of how I see things or how you see things but it's Jesus in the midst of us that brings us together so as iron sharpened iron and we wear in friction on each other yeah I may not have the same kind of like you know personal experiences you have huh. boy and you may not have the personal experiences I have woohoo thank God but the point is is that because God is in the midst of us inside us both to do it to all of his good pleasure causing us to experience him in a personal intimate way you have something I can learn from I have something you can learn from and how we learn that is by fellowshipping one with another so it's not really so important the aspect of whether we see eye to eye zoom in zoom out zoom in zoom out but whether we see clearly the Lord in the midst of us because when we do then we have a reality of who is standing before us it's not where two or more are gathered there I am in the midst it is obvious that he is in the midst of us because he is in me and he's in you and so because Jesus is in us we can learn from each other by the personal experiences and the Word of God as he's applied it to our lives and we've proven it out in our personal experience so it's not just an experiential thing but it's an applicable means with which the Holy Spirit has applied God's Word to our lives and we become a living testimony you and I separately become a living Bible we become the Word of God made alive we become the Word so while in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was God, in the end, the Word is God because the Word is in us and He is us and we become Him and we become likened unto Him so that we would be children of God. And as we do, the Word of God becomes alive and well and living inside us as we share those common experiences that maybe we don't see eye to eye, maybe we won't agree on everything there is in Scripture. Thank God because I like to learn from you even as I pray you may learn from something that's gone on in my life so don't be surprised if you see things differently you will don't be surprised if you don't completely agree 100 percent you know on everything the unity of the body of believers isn't such that it says that we have to agree on everything we do because no offense my shoes don't fit your shoes from your feet and your ministry may not fit into what I'm doing in ministering with the Lord and to the Lord and the way God is using me in some capacity to minister to others but I can accept that God is in you because of who you know and not necessarily what you know